We've all heard a story like this before. Max is a four-year-old Labrador retriever that absolutely loves spending time swimming in the lakes and ponds and running around in the fields. Unfortunately, a few days later after his swimming adventures, he fell sick. He was lethargic, he stopped eating, and his owner brought him to the vet. This is a story about Max. Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is May and I'm a vet, and today we'll talk about leptospirosis and why it's so important, why we should care about it, and how to prevent it. Everything is in the timestamps below, jump around and let's dive right in. So why should we even care about leptospirosis and what on earth am I talking about? Leptospirosis is a spiral-shaped bacteria that affects not only dogs but also humans. First, when the leptospira enters the body, so either through mucous membranes such as your gums, your conjunctiva, or broken skin and then it enters into the bloodstream, it will replicate into large numbers and then spread into various organs such as your liver, kidneys, lungs, your eyes, your central nervous system as well, so it can cause quite a lot of damage. And after a certain period of time, they sit in your kidney tubules, so your renal tubules, and then they are then shed into the urine for a few months, so that's how it spreads. As you can imagine, when it replicates into those organs, it causes damage to those areas and which lead to clinical signs. First important thing to know is that leptospirosis is a zoonosis, so humans can contract it from animals. If you come into contact with animals that are infected with leptospirosis, either through their blood, saliva, urine, you can get an infection. It might be mild or severe disease, but if it's severe, you can get things like pulmonary hemorrhagic syndrome, which translates to bleeding lung syndrome, which can lead to organ failure which is not great. I remember reading about this disease when I was very little in the news whenever there was a flood that happened locally. There would be reports of people contracting Wheels disease which is also another name for leptospirosis and can be quite fatal. So unfortunately Max contracted leptospirosis and what happened was he developed things like lethargy, fever, vomiting and also jaundice. So how does this happen? As mentioned, when the bacteria enters the bloodstream, they replicate and that causes inflammation in the blood, so vasculitis, which can lead to clotting disorders, bleeding disorders, which we see in animals, and you can detect that through clotting tests, which we will discuss in a second. After they travel into the bloodstream because of their corkscrew tail, you know, they move about, they're quite highly motile. So then they reach your lungs, liver, kidney, and cause acute injury there. In dogs, acute kidney injury and acute liver injury is what we commonly see that raises a suspicion of leptospirosis. Obviously, it can be caused by many other things as well, but if you have a dog that is not vaccinated, has high exposure uh, due to geographical location, like you know swimming in these areas, outdoor lifestyle, uh, living in the countryside, and they present with vomiting, jaundice, yellow mucous membranes, these are things that raise alarm bells, which would raise concerns for leptospirosis. Usually in a general practice setting, if we're presented with an animal that has lethargy, vomiting, jaundice, abdominal pain, we would start with a blood test or start with treatment if the owner refused tests. So let's say we started with a blood test and we see elevated liver and kidney levels. So your SDMA, urea creatinine for your renal parameters and your ALP, ALT for your liver parameters, for example then we would say, okay, there is something going on that's causing the problem in the liver and kidneys. When we come to a suspicion of leptospirosis, as we said, we will take a blood sample and urine sample. However, there can be false negatives if we had started antibiotic treatment beforehand, so then the bacterial load is not very high in the urine or blood, so we can't detect it. Doesn't mean there's no leptospirosis, it's just that we couldn't detect it based on the test. Or if you do the test in the wrong time, you may not be able to detect the disease. So if we wound back earlier, we mentioned that first the bacteria enters your bloodstream and it takes a few days for them to replicate in the bloodstream and then go into your organs, as mentioned. And then after a certain period of time, they settle in your kidneys and then they start shedding in the urine. So that tends to take about 15 days and um, it has been reported so if you test a bit before that you may not detect it in the urine and also testing is difficult because we do need to send it off to the lab and that can take a few days before the results come back and as mentioned in the consensus statement ideally we would start treatment before waiting for the results because the disease can progress quite quickly and as mentioned it's fatal and then you also have your paired microscopic agglutination test so your paired MAT it is the gold standard test where you have to 
take pair tighter samples at day 7 and at day 14, send it off to the lab and then to check the type of species of the bacteria and whether it is present and also can be a bit confusing to interpret based on their vaccination history as well. So while editing this section, I realized I heavily simplified the diagnostic test. So for those of you who are interested to know the sensitivity, specificity of each test, the ACVIM consensus statement really goes through each one and also has a clinical case definition for leptospirosis that can help you support your diagnosis when you're doing these tests. So check that out, I'll link it below. As you can see, it's not very straightforward to detect this disease. It costs money to do tests. It takes time for the results to come back. And also you need to interpret it according to the timing of the test and how it presents. So is leptospirosis easily treatable and how do we treat it? So based on the updated ACVIM consensus statement, immediate antibiotic therapy of doxycycline is recommended alongside supportive therapies. So if you can imagine when the dog is presented with liver and kidney injuries, it's going to be so painful. So they need pain relief on board and also antiemetics because they can feel quite nauseous. They don't want to eat. So nutrition is very important either by feeding tubes, esophageal tubes or nasogastric tubes, making sure they get highly digestible diets with enough energy for them to sustain themselves during this disease. Fluid therapy is also very important to make sure they don't have any electrolyte imbalances and also making sure that you have enough volume but not to overload them because iatrogenic volume overload is also one of the um, considerations for this disease. Any gastroprotectants to support their gastrointestinal system during this disease. And also a big thing is when we have a leptospirosis patient, isolation is so important. So we need to isolate this patient. Basically it is a zoonosis. So so not only can spread to other animals that may be present in the clinic, but it can also spread to humans. So when all the veterinary staff are dealing with this patient, they need to wear protective suits, so gloves, you know, goggles, PPE, full gowns, and making sure that there's no cross contamination. So it's quite a intensive sort of um, treatment. And management. Personally, I've dealt with one suspected leptospirosis case in the past. As mentioned, it's a difficult disease to detect, so a diagnosis wasn't achieved during that time, but we were had high suspicions of it based on like vaccination status, lifestyle, and the presenting signs. Unfortunately, that case did not survive. So you can see it's quite a heartbreaking disease as well. It has been reported that mortality rate is 33% with patients that receive treatments and early interventions having more success of surviving it. So what do we know so far? We know that leptospirosis is a spirochete bacteria that can be found in the environment, shed by rat infected rats or foxes, badgers, animals, and they can shed for like months and months. Once they contract the disease, it can be very, very harmful because it attacks various organs in your bloodstream and treatment can be very intensive, difficult, and not always successful. So what can we do about this? If you've answered vaccination, well done, you're very logical and I'm so proud of you. Vaccination can be one of the most logical and effective ways to build the immunity in our pets so they have less risk of contracting this fatal disease. But why does everyone think that this vaccine is like a silent killer? Let's dive into the facts and bust some myths. So first, let's look at the safety data presented by the VMD which is the Veterinary Medicine Directorate. Mind you, this is a regulatory body that's sole responsibility is to monitor for any adverse events in medications, vaccinations, things like that. So it's their job to make sure that all these medications are safe. And this report is publicly available online. You can look at the government website, their own website, so I'll link them down below. You may be aware that there are two types of leptospirosis vaccines, so L2 and L4, which basically says which strains they cover. Based on the most recent periodic safety update report, the data received for each product, the incidence of adverse animal events for all L2 vaccine products combined is 0.0. 16% and for leptospirosis vaccine the products the figure is 0.045%. In other words, the VMD has received fewer than 2 adverse events for lepto2 and fewer than 5 for lepto4 for every 10,000 doses sold. The overall incidence of suspected adverse events for both L2 and L4 vaccine products is therefore considered to be rare. So, for graphic purposes, 10,000 is equivalent to like a whole football stadium of people. And of the football stadium, five of the people may have had an adverse effect from the vaccine. The second myth 
is that leptospirosis is not a core vaccine. So the World Small Animal Veterinary Association has identified the leptospirosis vaccine as needed depending on geographical location and risk. In the UK, the British Small Animal Veterinary Association recommends lepto as part of the core vaccines because leptospirosis is found in lots of water sources, urine, and also urine contaminated soil. Another myth is that you only need one course of leptospirosis vaccines and you're good to go. Unfortunately, that is not the case. Unlike other vaccines that have high memory, lepto vaccine is not one of them. What that means is they only provide a short-lived immunity, so pets need to come back every year for a booster to make sure that their immunity levels are high to protect them from the disease. The immunity from infections as well is also short-lived, so if your pet had contracted leptospirosis, they survive, that is incredible, that is amazing. However, they do need to have their vaccinations up to date as well. Thankfully, in our story, Max's owner was very proactive and brought him to the vets as early as possible when he noted change in his appetite, him being down. So thankfully, the vets were able to start treatment and we managed to save Max. Also because Max was vaccinated and the owner was up to date with his vaccines, he can still contract leptospirosis. It's just that the vaccine helped to reduce the clinical signs that he was facing and he managed to overcome and recover from the disease. I sincerely hope that we can have more Maxes out there where the owners are looking after them, making sure that their vaccines are up to date so that we can protect them from this fatal disease. If you enjoyed this video, you might enjoy this next one about a common pet disease as well. Let me know what you'd like to see next and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!